down and listen to records Smell the cover, read all the verses Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. Here we are with episode 105. Today's very special guest is Steve Moore. Um, Steve Moore is an incredibly accomplished, prolific songwriter, composer, um, primarily in the electronic realm, probably best known for his band Zombie. And uh, But he has a an incredible discography uh in addition to the zombie catalog of his own work uh, under his own name. Sometimes he's gone under the name Lovelock. Um, but today he has collaborated with um, Nick Skrobisk from Multicult. Uh, I'm so sorry if I got that name wrong. I am having a very hard time with names and words. Let me just tell you. But um, Overcalc is the project of Nick's. And so this album that is being released as an EP is uh, Steve Moore and Overkelk, uh, simply entitled Calix. Now, I just need to say that uh, Steve Moore was a wonderful guest. Uh, great, great opportunity for me to speak with him uh, and about a band I know nothing about, Goblin. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely, there's definitely funny moments in this conversation where um, I, I, I have to admit that I just don't know anything about Goblin. And it, and so I was doing the research, and there is so little, so little information that I could use about this band and about this record that he chose, which is a very, very difficult one. It is out of print. It was only released as a CD in 1995. I can't even remember the freaking title of it. It's it, it it's like this long title. It's uh their their hits and rare tracks and outtakes from, I forget the years, 1970-something to, to I, I, I don't even know. Um, I will include a link in the show notes so you can see it. You can see what I'm talking about. Um, I don't think there's going to be a way to hear it. I mean, you know, Steve says to me, he's like pretty sure that there's a playlist for it on, on YouTube. I'm pretty sure there's not. I looked, I looked for it, obviously, to, to try to hear it, and um, so I've listened to some other things, but not this album, because I can't. It's just not available anywhere. Um, so it was kind of a, a strange conversation in that in that regards, but, uh, but Steve actually is so closely knit, like so closely tied to this thing, to this album, and this time in his life where he discovered it. Uh, which is the focal point of the conversation, essentially, and um, and enlightening. Uh, if you're a fan of Steve's and, and a fan of, uh, like, let's say, just Zombie, his, his band, um, closely tied, very closely tied, and a very interesting kind of pinpoint in, in, in Steve's life that uh, we, I tried to get to. So, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to let you into the show. Um, we hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, all we ask is that you please do all the things you do with the internet, like, share, subscribe, comment, rate, review, all of those things. Uh, they all really help us uh, greatly with no money from you whatsoever. But if you do care to help us in a financial way, you just have to visit our website, uh, psychicstatic.net, and uh, anything you purchase there goes towards funding this project. And we would deeply and greatly appreciate it. Oh, uh, two things. First of all, I'm going to be selling, actually, some records at the Rock and Roll Yard Sale in Somerville, September 17th. It's a Sunday. Uh, we actually got rained out this weekend, so uh, it'll be the following weekend. September 17th, mark your calendar if you're in Somerville, Mass., or somewhere near it. Uh, definitely worth it. Uh, lots of record vendors if you're into the records, obviously, and I will have some amazing deals because I am I am just getting this, getting rid of stuff. Uh, you can get some stuff at a really reasonable prices with me, so come and visit me, please. And um, no video today. I'm sorry there was a mishap with the uh, with technology today, and the video feed is not available. So it's all audio, audio this time, and uh, hope you don't mind, but it'll be up on YouTube regardless. I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much, folks. Enjoy. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hello, Steve Thanks. Moore. Hey, yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Um, now, I've been doing some research about you, and, and um, 
You are originally from Pittsburgh, is that right? I'm originally from Pittsburgh, yeah. Yeah, and through different uh, you know, through the 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 you know, the fates of the winds and whatever, I've ended up uh in Albany. Uh, but I don't know how long I'll be here. Uh it's just uh where I am for now. Right, right. Okay. Cool. Um yeah, because I have actually, I realized that you have played briefly with uh, with microwaves. Oh yeah, they. I mean, that was like my before I ever became involved in doing film scores or doing uh, playing with my band Zombie. Uh, microwaves was my main band for a long time, uh, and I just worked on their newest record as well uh they're they're good old like really like long time friends of mine so yeah yeah that's great yeah i've spoken to uh to john and and dave in the past yeah okay john roman and dr dave that's what we call dave Cousy, uh <laughs> dr dave because he just he knows about everything uh he can Anytime you have something that's wrong, that's broken in your rig, he can fix it. He's he's Doctor Dave. Yeah, has he ever helped you with your stuff? Because I mean, I imagine oh, you have absolutely. so many. Oh, absolutely, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. He's a good guy to know for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, he's been very, very nice. To, uh, I've met him on a few occasions now, and it's been great. So, uh, you know, I was here to speak with you uh, about not only your latest work, which is a uh, collaboration with. Uh, Tell me if I pronounce these incorrectly. Uh, Overcalc. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so it, that's Nick Scrobis. Scrobis. Yeah. yeah. Of Multicult. Yeah. Yeah. How did how did that come to be? Well, uh, he 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 hit me up for a remix um, to do a remix of one of his songs for Overcalc, uh, and. Uh, I did that and in doing so I at the same time was like you know messaging a bunch of friends of mine that I thought might be mutual friends of Nick's and I was like you know this Nick guy is off the off the chain man like he's he's such a great guitarist and he has also a really great sensibility for programming uh synthesizers as well uh so I, when, when like I put this all together, I just thought like, well, yeah, let's do this remix, but that's, you know, let's also, uh, do a full on collab. And, uh, I had a few ideas and like lying around that I was like, oh, I think this could, uh, could work really good with Nick, uh, and he has some ideas that he sent to me and it just all, it all came together really, uh, very organically and naturally. Uh, I think our, you know, our sensibilities are like, we, maybe we make like different kinds of music, but, uh, you know, when it all boils down to it, we're all drawing influence from the same types of places, you know, uh, mm. So it all it all ends up working together. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, now, so I I have a I'm just gonna tell you to, very honestly I I I'm not very familiar with like electronic music in general. Like okay. it's probably the thing I know the least about. Um, but I've been getting into it more. I've been kind of doing more listening to it. Obviously, to prepare for today, I've had to listen to uh, a lot of your work and a lot of the. Uh, of uh, the band Goblin that you have uh, chosen oh, yeah, for today. For sure. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting stuff. It's very, very interesting stuff. I mean, I, I can definitely, I, I hear it and I, and it definitely makes me think about specific kind of like times and places uh, in like kind of music history, I guess. Yeah. yeah de um, definitely. I guess the first thing I kind of wanted to ask you about your, current project uh the album uh the ep uh calyx the new ep between uh between you and uh over over calc um over -calc. yeah over calc yeah is like the visual aspect between it because 
you know the the album artwork is a is a photograph of like what seems to be uh some kind of cactus uh some kind of like southwestern yeah. um foliage and then your music video for for the first uh single is also kind of like footage from the southwest kind of like desert like footage and i'm just curious like does the music have anything to do like is that like does that visual kind of connected to that music in any way well like i both you know both nick and i have uh toured all through the southwest uh of the united states and it's just uh a very beautiful and alien sort of place. Uh, hmm. but Nick put that all together. Uh, he had shot a bunch of like beautiful footage of, you know, the drives from, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, Santa Fe to Albuquerque to, you know, to Phoenix to, to San Diego, you know, he had, he had sort of, uh, documented all of these drives and they, these are some of my favorite drives as well. And they, it, it really, uh, the whole idea was that it, it presents this sort of alien landscape, you know, because that's what we're, that's what we're going for with this music. Like, yes, it's, you think it's going to be minimal techno, but then there's all this like guitar in it. And you're like, well, this is completely alien. And that's what we wanted. Uh, we wanted like a landscape that would reflect that alien nature, you know? Uh, hmm. okay. And, and, and I, and I really think that the, the Southwest, of the United States is probably the close. I mean, it's the closest thing to like Mars we're going to see, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think what we were thinking in, in those terms, but, uh, but also I can't speak on uh, Nick's behalf. I know that he, he had the, the, the video was all, that was all him. He put that all together himself. Uh, I know that we had spoken about it and uh, about, you know, touchstones, but that's about it, really. Oh, OK. Yeah, I was just curious because, uh, you know, I think especially for your line of work, uh, obviously the the visual aspect, uh, you know, primarily in, in film, because you do a lot of film scoring. Yeah. Uh, and the music has to be connected in some way. Obviously, you uh, you're probably familiar with the way that music can make can can kind of create a feeling and a vibe. So I didn't know if that was kind of part, like, part of that uh, imagery. I mean, I'm sure it factors in because that's my, uh, I mean, that's my world uh, nowadays. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I do like there is a new zombie record coming. There is, uh, I do have new solo records coming, but the the majority of what I do these days is uh, production music for different, uh, either different production libraries or for uh, specific, you know, movies or uh, TV shows or something like that. So, uh, right. I I'm I'm always looking at things from a like a you know, sort of a narrative perspective. Like I want, like when I make music, I want it to tell a story, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I want it to be, you know, Im important basically. Uh, I want the music to be like, almost like, uh, a whole separate character in, in the film, uh, that that is telling you things that maybe the actors shouldn't be telling you or don't you know the the director doesn't want the actors to tell you this yet but it's something that you might want to start thinking about and so that's those are definitely points where i think that the the score can be very useful uh in in you know sort of dictating the the narrative of the story really oh yeah yeah of course sure 
Um, now, I, I know that you have uh, you went to college for music education, correct? I'm not sure exactly yeah, yes, what your yeah. what your major was. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. My regiment was the same as a music performance major. Uh, uh, and, and I, I essentially graduated with, uh, it wasn't, uh, the, the, the credits didn't transfer, but it was, I was also like a, a major in saxophone performance of all things. Uh, yeah, the saxophone is what I majored in in college. Uh, and that's what I really, uh, you know, have, have been able to excel at in, in the world. Uh, so really? yeah, that I, and I, and I rarely get to use that. So it's, it's, uh, interesting. Um, it, it's like most college graduates. I mean, how often do you really use that degree? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like that was, this was the nineties and like, you know, had a, had it been another decade or two later, maybe I wouldn't have even gone to college. I don't even know, you know. Uh, yeah, right. Well, because I was wondering. I mean, with your with that um, with that education uh, in in the in music, uh, I was wondering if if that informs your your creative productivity at all. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I I learned so much uh, going to school for music. You know, I I learned. You know, I can uh, orchestrate, I can write music for a full orchestra if I want to, you know, like I've mm -hmm. I've learned and I've learned my way around a lot of different instruments. Uh, you know, of course, uh, I don't really do it on this project, but like I play, I'm very proficient on the saxophone. But I also am pretty fluent on the, like the flute. I can get around on the cello. Uh, I have a, a a broad. I'm not. I'm a, I'm truly like a jack of all trades, master of none. You know, like I, <laughs> like there's okay. there's no one thing that I really am like really good at. But I but I know how to do a lot of different stuff, and that comes in handy. You know. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it does. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you're doing film scoring and stuff like that, because again, oh God, you know, it's 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 super handy with that. Yeah, for sure. Like yeah. the last score I did, uh, you know, I played a ton of saxophone on and like it's like, you know, like I went to, you know, I I've been playing the saxophone since I was, uh, you know, 12 years old. Uh, and uh, and at this point, like I really have like a, a tone and it sounded really good. And like when I've seen, I saw the premiere of the film and like people cheered for the saxophone, like, uh, so that definitely was very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, well, speaking of that, speaking of like your, your childhood being around 12 years old, I'm curious, like, so, so you grew up in Pittsburgh, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, <laughs> to be to be even more specific, I grew up in Monroeville, which is uh, it's a suburb of Pittsburgh, but it's where the Monroeville Mall is where they filmed Dawn of the Dead. Oh, cool. So like and that's like that was literally like a few miles from my house. And that was like the mall that we always went to, you know, like we would always we would go there like three or four times a week uh, just to get some lunch or shop for some dumb toys or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it was like the the fact was like I learned very early on about the fact that uh, Dawn of the Dead had been filmed at the Monroeville Mall. And so that mall always held this really special place for me where it was like it was something that i grew up with as being just so mundane and so every day and then i see it in this new context like the way george romero wanted it to be seen and uh and i and i just became sort of obsessed with it yeah OK, yeah, yeah, that's pretty that's pretty crazy that 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 should be the case, because I mean, like, well, what what came first, like uh, your love for for horror movies or or kind of being in that mall and then only coming to, to realize what it was used for after the fact? 
I think it, it it's probably a combination of both of those, really. But like, really, the the fact was like I grew up loving this mall, and then I remember I was probably about like twelve, so this was maybe like eighty seven or eighty eight, uh, where I, when I first saw Dawn of the Dead, and I realized that it. Was, it took place all around Monroeville, like even not even, you know, not even just the uh, the the mall portions, but like the the airport uh, that they there's like an airport. There's a pretty crucial airport scene, and it's that airport also is in Monroeville, uh, just a few miles from where I grew up, really. Uh, and and it was really it was crazy for me to see these things that i knew from my childhood represented uh you know for the ages uh in this context and it changed everything like from there on out like even as young as like an early teenager like i just knew that like this is the world for me like this is what i want to do you know yeah that's pretty pretty interesting that that should be it kind of seems almost uh serendipitous that that you know you're growing up in this area that happens to be you know one of these kind of integral portions of like pop history that you end up yeah, totally. falling in love with is right totally. there in your backyard basically yeah it was it was really uh I mean, to me, it seemed very natural and it seemed just like, you know, because all these movies would like there were there were like the the different like UHF stations back in the day would would uh, would play all these different horror movies on. Uh, they'd play them like late nights, Friday nights or Saturday nights or some sometimes Sunday nights. Uh, you know, I'm talking about like this is before I was able to, you know, drive myself to the uh, video store and rent whatever I wanted. Like this is way before DVR, way before, you know, like it's Screaming. like whatever, whatever was on TV, like that's what you got stuck with. And fortunately, there were enough programs back then that were things that I really connected to uh that you know like uh, uh one of my favorites is uh and and i know this is like it's very rare that i find someone else who's really into this but friday the 13th the series the series do you remember that that was it was from like it lasted from like 87 through like maybe 1990 it was like three seasons oh wow yeah. uh, no, I don't remember had, that. Yeah, Friday the 13th, the series. It was a Canadian production, all filmed in Toronto uh, and and around. Like, there was some, some stuff filmed in, like, Montreal, but, like, most of it was Toronto. It was all Canadian cast and crew. Uh, but but it was – it had nothing to do with Jason at all. Like, it was – it was about, like – two like like 20 somethings who inherited a store where they had they ended up selling like a bunch of cursed antiques and then they had to get them all back oh huh. that's yeah, weird it was really weird yeah it was a it was a weird premise but that was like one of my favorite shows back in the day uh and uh i remember that was that was very important the uh the score by fred molin was uh very important uh, yeah for me okay yeah it sounds like a weird show it sounds like it's, it's surprising that it lasted three seasons but i mean uh um, you know it's good that it, you were able to to experience it at least because obviously it, it was profound to you yeah it was uh, no, important. yeah a little bit more about your childhood i mean so what was yeah. music like in the in the home growing up okay well uh i mean i rem like my uh my dad was he had a great record collection and even back like i was born in 1975 uh so like i remember like listening to 
my dad's like eight tracks, you know, uh, mm-hmm. he had a ton of records, but the eight tracks for some reason were just easier to dial up for him. Uh, sure. and, uh, the two eight tracks that really connected with me were, uh, the, um, the soundtrack for the movie FM, uh, which mm. was about like a pirate or not a pirate radio station, but it was, it was about a radio station who was threatened to be shut down and they got all these like people to rally around them and try to keep them afloat. But, uh, it had, let me, let me see if I can remember, uh, some of these tracks, uh, uh, life's been good by Joe Walsh. Uh, okay. The the title track was by Steely Dan. Uh, oh, okay. FM, uh, and that's that was a Steely Dan uh, original for the movie. Uh, there was there were some Eagles jams. Uh, there was the Joe Walsh jam. Uh, oh, and also my my other favorites were Queen. We will rock you and. Mm-hmm. And I will say that the thing about Queen, We Will Rock You, that I I remember, like, even as a very young child, the thing that really, like, got me about that song is, like, when the guitar does come in, it's brilliant. It's, the tone is just pure genius. Uh, yeah. that, and that's what really, like, that's probably my favorite uh uh, memory of that album but yeah that was yeah. that was an important early album for sure hmm. okay so w- when do you think you got bit by the bug like to to like when did you think that music was your it was your passion i mean i feel like i kind of knew it very early on uh even even as like a, a middle schooler uh i kind of you know, like I was all right at math. I was all right at science. I was all right at everything else, but I was like, I was really good at music. And so I, I took that seriously and I really just sort of like followed that, that trend. Uh, yeah. Well, cause then you said you started playing sax around 12. Was that the first instrument that you picked up? Well, I mean, I, I had, uh, my dad had a couple, uh, vintage, uh, synthesizers when I was a little kid and I would play around on those before I had even played the saxophone. So in a way I would say the keyboards are probably what I picked up first, but the saxophone is what, like, I mean, I would. I would practice saxophone like hours for every night. Like I really wanted to be a really good saxophone player for a long time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But so when, like, when do you think that it hits you that, that you could actually possibly do that as a career or did that ever even cross your mind as a young person? Uh, as a young person, it didn't really, uh, cross my mind. You know, there were, uh, I had to work, um, I worked at like, as a, as a law clerk at like different law firms in Pittsburgh. Uh, and it was, uh, it was pretty brutal really. Uh, yeah, there were, there was a long, there was, there were, uh, long periods of time where I didn't think it was going to work at all. Uh, but I just kept at it. Right. Okay. Um, so one of the questions that I had for you that were, that I was going to kind of get to as we discuss the album that you've chosen for today was, yeah. um, the song, I'm going to murder this because I'm horrible at Italian, <clears throat> but, uh, the song La, L'Alba di Morti v- oh, Viventi, yeah. Yeah. which is off of the zombie soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, from what I learned, uh, Daria Argento was the, was the producer of that and kind of claimed the the rights for the european release and so he took some liberties uh, as a caveat to that licensing right uh including some of the um the soundtrack work like re, 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 reproducing the soundtrack worth work and having goblin come in and do the majority of it i'm sure yeah um and then some of that some of goblin's music uh ended up um 
I guess George A. Romero ended up liking it and using some of it in the U.S. release. Oh, yeah. Was was sure. that your first? Was that your first experience with Goblin? Or absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, my first experience. Uh, uh, that's that's basically why I chose. Uh, because I feel like the album I chose for uh, for our exploration here is kind of weird because it's uh, a comp CD, but uh, yeah. it was literally, it came out in 1995 and it was really the first time that any of that stuff had been released on CD. Uh, so like, unless you were lucky enough to have found one of those OG pressings on vinyl, you know, like really like this CD release was the first time that a lot of people, myself included, were able to actually hear these songs like without like, like on their own without the, the sound effects and everything. And it just, it, it, it just changed my life because I realized that like, like this music that they were writing was so, so in depth, so complicated and so incredible. And like, I just, yeah, that I just realized like, that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to do what, you know, what they're doing. Yeah. And so, so your first experience with Goblin was 95 or was it before that? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I had, uh, I had obviously seen Dawn of the Dead previously, uh, but that was probably the only, uh, my only experience with Goblin. But I remember, I think I had to special order the CD from Barnes and Noble because uh, they didn't actually stock it, but mm. I was like, I was like the weird kind of kid who was like already searching for Goblin, you know, uh, and that came up. And I remember when I got that, it just changed uh, everything. One, once I could really hear what these guys were doing, which was like, I mean, these guys are phenomenal musicians and I went on, to actually work with them, you know? So like, I know that these are, this is the, the, the upper echelon of, you know, musicianship really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about that. I noticed that you got to perform with them in 2014, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So how did that come to be? Well, uh, my, my band zombie, uh, which is obviously very, uh, we got our name from the Italian cut of Dawn of the Dead and we're very, uh, we're very much so influenced, uh, by Goblin, but we had, uh, we had the opportunity to open for them, uh, on, on a U.S. tour, uh, we had a really fun time and it was great. And then one of their keyboardists wasn't able to do the next tour and they got in touch with me and asked if I'd be interested. And it was like, they were like, well, you'll have to play saxophones, uh, guitar or, uh, synthesizer and maybe doing a little bit of singing. And I was like, Oh hell yeah, I'll do all of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so yeah, that was it was it was uh uh really like when I when I joke with people these days it's like anything I do now is just really all icing on the cake because I got to play with this, I I got to play with Goblin, you know. I mean, yeah. It's all it's all uh icing on the cake from here on out. Uh Right. And how many how many dates did you get to do with them? We did uh it was a it was a short run. It was a, it was about two weeks from uh we started in Miami and then shot uh the whole way across uh the south and ended up uh doing like three or four dates in California and that was the end. Oh, okay. 
that's still amazing though. I'm sure it was just like a lifetime of memories for you to kind of be able oh, to be God, there with yeah. your, your, your idols. Let's just call them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Hands, hands down my idols for sure. Amazing. Man. Um, now, so you picked up this album, like this album that you're, you're correct in saying that it's a little weird because it's a compilation uh, and it came out in 1995. You bought it in 1995, but you knew of them prior like just through the movies, I guess, right? I knew I knew of them just through the movies, but when I saw the minute I saw that they had released uh, uh, like a, a CD that had some of this music on it, uh, I knew that I had to have it. And uh, hearing the underscores for some of these movies, and a lot of them I haven't I hadn't even seen at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, because it was still like this was kind of before like the big DVD Blu-ray proliferation, you know, like a lot of these movies weren't even available outside of like weird, like, you know, VHS tapes that are the wrong region, you know, yeah. uh, indie video stores, maybe. Something yeah, like that. exactly. Yeah. So that that was like the only way to find some of this stuff. Uh it was right around that time that I I started realizing, like, at the time, I mean, like, okay, so this was, this was 1995. I was 20 years old. Uh, I was still at college, and my whole thing was like, I was, I was just coming out of like, at least five or six years of like being like playing mostly in like hardcore bands of all things. Uh, Mm -hmm. But then I also, because I was a saxophone major at college, I was also doing like, uh, like dinner jazz kind of gigs. So, and I was just like looking for something new and something to like inspire me. And when I, when I heard that, it really inspired me, like to the point that it really changed, the, really kind of the whole trajectory of of my life. Where I realized, you know, for sure that I really wanted to make music like this, and and you know, potentially make uh, film scores as well. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it, it literally was like that. This was the the literal pinpoint to like that that turn in your life where all of a sudden you're like obsessing about synths obsessing about film scores and so forth yeah i would i would definitely say that this this exact comp cd and that's why like it's weird to choose a comp cd for something like this but it was it was literally the first time any of this stuff was available on cd uh so like and and like for me living in the suburbs, you know, like I wasn't like I there's no way I was ever going to find any of this stuff on vinyl. Uh, you know, uh right. It was it was just like it wasn't until it was uh released on CD by DRG, which was a great series. They had so many there were several Morricone uh collections uh there was the morricone argento trilogy uh Mm. cd there was there was like the morricone westerns cd uh there was just like the general morricone horror cd this company drg with the classic italian film scores they put out so many great scores and that was like really the first time that any of this stuff was ever on cd so it it uh for me it was really important because to me at that at that point like i was still listening to a lot of cds and it was sort of important to be able to find stuff on that medium you know oh yeah well at the time i mean 95 it's kind of that was the peak of of digital media really i mean vinyl was I mean, like it was really, I mean, what, 95? I mean, that's only that's only like a year after Kurt Cobain died, you know? I mean, right. that's like like 95 is like ancient history in a weird way, you know? Like <laughs> a lot has was, changed, yeah. 
Yeah, a lot of ch- has changed, but like, and this was even before, this was before Napster. This was before any kind of file sharing, you know? Uh, right. The only way you were going to be able to find these tracks was by purchasing these CDs. Uh, and uh, And it really... For me, I really kind of loved the exclusivity of that, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I liked, I, I liked, I've always been uh, sort of contrarian, and like, I think I always liked the idea of like being into music that like other people aren't going to be into, you know. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, the premise of this show is is a weird one because, first of all, it's hard to pick like one album to speak about for for a musician that that was inspirational yeah. or influential. It, it took me a while to figure out exactly what I was going to choose. For yeah, sure. yeah, and and then like so when when um, when Curran got back to me with your choice, I was just dumbfounded because I was just like, "What is this?" <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea who Goblin was. I had no idea. Oh wow! Who, oh yeah. wow! I'm not a big horror movie fan, and so like, okay. That, music scoring and this kind of genre specifically just like really is is just i had no idea completely oblivious to it really oh boy wow so i uh i'm hoping that i've blown your mind here because these guys have some (laughs) incredible music to to dive into oh Uh, yeah yeah and i have been and it's been a lot i mean uh, look honestly between between your discography and goblin's discography i have just been drowning in like <laughs> electronica and like you know synth music it's been <laughs> insane i've been like i've been trying to digest as much as i can and honestly like i i haven't had enough time i i haven't been able to get through everything i try to like yeah, you know yeah. i typically pride myself on like you know trying to learn everything i can about the artist and the the chosen album and all of that stuff and i and i can't i just can't it's no, just way probably, too much that's- that's probably my fault. I have a ridiculous amount no. of stuff available. Uh, no, but you know, I, I I appreciate your choice because, like, you know, when I when it was given to me, I was just like, "Is he fucking with me? What is this?" Like, because I can't find it. I can't find it anywhere. I can't like this album is not available for streaming anywhere. No, it's, it's not on it's way out of print. Way yeah, out. and it's not on YouTube. I figured, okay, maybe it's on YouTube. It's not. There's a few different compilations. I mean, and like to go through the track listing of the CD itself. I mean, I was able to find some of the tracks individually, and I kind of like created my own playlist just to kind yeah. of like get a feel for it. But I don't. I haven't been able to listen to all of this stuff. I don't know all of it. And then, you know, the band alone is uh, is fairly obscure, you know, like like you're saying, like you kind of like, you know, take pride and in, in kind of being a little bit of uh, of uh, absurdist, I guess, in, in your, you know, your musical background, like, you know, kind of what inspires you, what you like. Yeah, and that- for sure. But but at the same time, like I really do like it's not like there's no irony like I know there's not. Uh, I genuinely like Goblin is my favorite band ever. And I will say that until the end of the, uh, the end of my days. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that, that's what I was trying to get to is just that like, I, I completely see it. I mean, like, first of all, I mean, yeah, the music that you make can is heavily tied to, to, to the, the style of music that Goblin's making, oh, sure. not only, not only in the synth aspect, but because, you know, they, they were primarily a uh, film score, like a film score band. Yeah. And, you know, heavily intertwined into the film, uh, into the horror movie genre. Absolutely. So I totally see it, man. I totally see that connection. I mean, it's nice to know that it that like in this case, because it, it's not always the situation. But in this case, you know, the the album that you're choosing and kind of citing as like a, a pivotal uh, uh, pivotal moment in your life and, and in career is is very much intertwined with what you do currently oh yeah for sure well that i mean that's the whole point of it is that like this was the album that like when i heard it when i when i was first able to like special order it from barnes and noble or whatever uh whatever i had to do back in in the 90s to get this cd uh when i heard this i just thought like well I want to be in a band that makes something similar to this. And it was like, so it was really important in the the whole 
formulation of my band Zombie. Like, I don't think had these not had these scores not been reissued on on CD in the 90s, I don't know that we would have done what we do, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Was Zombie or in existence before you heard this album or no, only after? No, no, we, we uh, the first time, the first time we got together was in uh, 2000, the year 2000. Uh, okay. And, uh, and even then it was just, uh, Tony was playing drums and I was playing saxophone and it was just basically a free improv group. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, it took a, it took a couple of years for us to reach uh, a concept for our band. Uh, but yeah, uh, the first time, yeah, we, and this was, uh, I think that Tony also, also had this same CD collection and we, like when we first met and realized that we were into the same stuff that we realized that we had to try to do uh something you know together for sure yeah okay and so uh follow-up question uh what yeah. was the first synth you bought oh okay my very first synthesizer was uh it's it's it was a realistic mg1 uh that's the name uh, realistic, if you'll, uh, if you might remember, is the name of all Radio Shack branded products. Yeah, uh, sure. It was, uh, it was, a uh, it was a, a synthesizer produced by Radio Shack, but it was designed by Bob Moog. So oh. it was, it was literally a Moog synthesizer in a Radio Shack case. Uh, and yeah. uh, you used, like, back, I mean, I and I bought this, I bought it in, like, uh, 1999 or 98 or something like that, and nobody was interested in this stuff at that point. I think I got it for, like, 50 bucks or something. Uh, and it was, it was, it's literally a Moog-designed synthesizer branded with a realistic Radio Shack brand. And like, so nobody ever took it seriously, but that was, that was my first synthesizer that I ever bought. Yeah. Mm, cool. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's also helpful information. Uh, if anyone out there is into the synths. Um, oh, if, anyone, if anyone ever sees one of these in the wild, definitely snatch it up. They're great. Yeah. If, if someone hasn't already been you know privy to the information as it's like charging right. hundreds of dollars for it if not more sure um so let's see uh i'd like to kind of talk about goblin for a little bit because yeah. um i don't have very much information to be completely honest with you uh i i can't find a lot uh especially based on this compilation and the songs that are on it there was very little information i had to work off of so uh, i have very few questions for you really Okay. If, any, if anything, I think you might, you'll probably be uh, more of a resource to me than anything else I could have found online. Yeah, I mean, I know these guys. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. So um, let's see, like early history of the band. Uh, they started off um, uh, as like a prog rock band. Uh, Cherry Red. No, well, Cherry Red wasn't the first name of their band. Cherry was, Five. Uh, Cherry Five. Yeah. Um, the first name of their band was Oliver. Is that how they started off? Yeah, Oliver was the very first band. And then Cherry Five was the first one that I remember being able to hear about. Those and 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 I'm I'm not sure if you've heard any of that stuff, but it is uh it's incredible. Uh that record uh is is really phenomenal. Uh mm. but yeah, they started off there's there's a track on the Cherry Five record where uh you can actually hear uh like the moment that dario argento heard them and was like oh these guys could work with me uh there's a very creepy moment in one of their songs uh yes and that was basically the beginning of their working with dario argento and that that's what you know you know sort of propelled these guys to uh 
you know, stardom in Italy. But I mean, you know, the fact was that most of these guys were studio musicians working on like, you know, tons of different records. Like I have, uh, I have a bunch of different LPs that uh, Fabio Pignatelli, the bass player Mm -hmm. uh, that he played on uh, that are just, they're just straight up Italian pop records, you know, Uh, but it's got Fabio Pignatelli on it. So I had to get it. He's, I'll say it. I've said it many times before and I'll, I will continue to say it that Fabio Pignatelli is just, the greatest bass player in the world and, and absolutely my hero. He's such a sweet dude hmm. and really an incredible bass player. He's the only he's the only guy who played on literally all of the old Goblin soundtracks and scores uh, and okay. albums. Uh, he's the only, like back in the day, like now there's, Claudio Simonetti's Goblin, which is just Claudio and a bunch of other people. But up until that, uh, Fabio was the one, the he was the linchpin that held it all together. Yeah, yeah. And his work is great. I remember I did hear some of the songs off of that uh, Cherry 5 record. And uh, yeah, it's very reminiscent of like early Yes. Like, oh, uh, yeah. There, he's... Uh, yeah, Fabio is a massive Chris Squire fan, as as we all are. You sure. know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, what's not to love about the dude? But uh, you know, like you know, right down to like Fabio plays a a Rickenbacker, and uh, you know, he he's definitely going for that. Like like those guys are very much inspired by, uh, yes, uh, by. Crimson by crimson by absolutely by genesis they're big genesis fans oh, okay uh, yeah yeah that makes sense um so actually it was uh you you mentioned his name uh, claudio simonetti it was his yeah. father who was also a musician and a, and a film uh score or he or he an engineer that recorded film scores right oh i i'm not even sure about that i don't know about that yeah well that's what i had heard in, in the research was uh that his father was uh recorded film scores so i assume that meant he was an engineer of some oh, sort wow, he, was, okay. he was in the business somehow yeah. and he introduced them to uh to carlo bixio the founder of cinevox right right and that's kind of how they got their their start. Uh, even though Cinevox was kind of specifically a uh, a film score label, uh, they were kind of trying to shop themselves as this band. Yeah. And uh, but you know he he saw the the potential in them and signed them uh, both for uh, for film scores and for just being studio musicians. So that's yeah. you know kind of how they got their start yeah. as uh, musicians in a number of different uh, projects. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, any of the uh, the Lucio Fulci movies, uh, horror movies, but uh, uh, Fabio Frizzi was the composer on a lot of those scores, but... Uh, through touring with those guys, I I learned that uh, m- the vast majority of it was Goblin. Hi- like they like they hired Goblin to play. Uh, like like Goblin was essentially like the rhythm section, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, everything else went over top of that. So they were they were very in demand for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Let's see. So uh, moving on, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the first song on this record, the uh, Profondo Rosso. Yeah. So from what I learned, uh, this is the band's first collaboration with the filmmaker Dario Argento. Yeah. And Argento had originally contacted jazz pianist and composer Giorgio Gaslini to score the film. Right. he, He was unhappy with the output. Uh, he deemed it awful. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so end up, uh, Argento ultimately ended up contacting Goblin, uh, after failing to, uh, get Pink Floyd to, to participate in the soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty nuts. Uh, it's a crazy story, but I mean, 
uh yeah goblin is as close to pink floyd as you're gonna get uh they're like kind of the italian pink floyd uh sure they, you know those guys like they not only are yeah i think it it all it all worked out in the long run because that that score that they came up with is just really sort of indelible with that film uh Mm. And and it it is it's it is a bit Pink Floyd, but it's also like it just has its own character. Uh, it has its own personality that really is is was like that's what drew me to it was that like I had heard music kind of like this, but not exactly like this, you know, because. I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh in Southwestern PA and there was all like Pink Floyd was on the radio all the time. And this was like, this was like some exotic Pink Floyd that I had never heard before, you know? Uh, And uh, maybe that's part of what really drew me to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. I mean, it's, it is definitely uh, a strange, you know, style of music uh especially for the time i would imagine i mean not much of unless you were kind of like you know knee deep into the horror genre and kind of like you know focusing on the set on the uh the soundtrack work the scores um i can't imagine there was anything else readily available that sounded like this yeah for sure okay so uh let's move on uh like i said i don't have a lot so i'm going to skip down to a just a few random tracks um yeah. So for the the chi or cha oh, or not, yeah. the this is a theme from the original TV show from 1976. Yeah. Uh, bassist Fabio Pignatelli said that there are aspects of this that were inspired by Herbie Hancock's Headhunter period. Oh, I believe it. I totally believe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, so we've been talking a lot about Goblin and how influential they were on you uh, and the work that you do. But what like what other artists can you cite as like inspirations to, to some of the stuff that you make and maybe specifically towards this existing new project with, uh, over Oh, uh, well for that, uh, for, for what we've been doing, uh, I was really more drawn towards, you know, sort of, uh, Detroit techno type of, uh, like a Detroit techno kind of sound like a real, like a real honest, minimal techno sound. And uh, some of the guys that I draw major inspiration from are, uh, uh, of course, Carl Craig, who is just like the godfather. Uh, Who else might I cite? Uh, He's probably the biggest of my inspirations uh, when it comes to those types of... uh, that type of uh oh maybe robert hood oh yeah robert hood too for sure uh you know these like old like you know tried and true you know motor city techno kind of guys uh who really have a good uh a good perspective on how to make a how to make a track work uh a techno track you know uh so I, I'm I'm very interested in guys like that. I feel like that was probably like like stuff like that is probably the most important uh influence on what I was doing here with Overcalc. Uh hmm. because it was really like I was trying to give him like uh you know, sort of like a landscape that he could just do what he wanted to do with, you know, really just take, take all the liberties he wanted to take. Uh, it was more about just creating a, a foundation for him, uh, to yeah. play, to play guitar over and to add his synthesizers, uh, which he's just very, uh, adept at both. Oh, okay. And so w- that was a, um, uh, what do they call that? Like, I uh, why i'm forgetting the goddamn word jesus christ like what we're doing now what is this called this is a conference call it's a 
<laughs> I would say that. Yeah. It's it was that like the way that you guys worked together on this project? You kind of like were were uh conferencing back and forth or or did you actually get to collaborate together like in person? No, unfortunately we never actually uh we have met in person, but we've never uh been able to actually uh do any of this uh collaborative process in person that's all been remote for sure remote there's that word thank yeah. you remote now oh, there we go <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i'm sorry i'm i'm, I'm freaking out of my mind today i'm i've i got my wisdom teeth out like just a few days ago oh no okay and i'm just like i i, I can barely talk really <laughs> um all right so let's all see right, that. that's okay I mean, it had to be done so um so let's moving on uh one of the other things i i found out some information about was uh suspiria yeah uh, probably the, they're they're one of their biggest tracks they're one of their biggest uh works uh, as far as you know scoring is concerned yeah it is it is probably their uh it is probably goblin's greatest artistic triumph uh it's yeah. just, it's just an incredible score uh really phenomenal yeah i mean as a fan i mean i, I was going to say that it's probably their most popular uh but as a fan you're also saying that it is definitely their their best work yeah i would say so i would think so uh uh i think uh it's maybe not necessarily my favorite because my favorite is the stuff that they did for dawn of the dead uh okay you know like it's a like i i love that i love dawn of the dead from when i was a kid and uh you know it it it's so so that sort of taints my vision yeah uh, it's nostalgic for you it definitely there's there's a nostalgic touch for sure uh but i would say that yeah i think uh suspiria is there i mean it's just a a a mind-blowing score really so phenomenal hmm. okay well so definitely, in an interview definitely in in my humble opinion i definitely think that uh suspiria is their uh their tried and true best okay so uh in an interview with style magazine uh claudio simonetti said quote in the beginning we read the script and started to record but after the film was edited and finished we decided not to use it it's like if you read a book and go see the movie. Normally, nobody likes it because your idea of it is different. When the oh. film was finished, the mood was completely different. So we threw away everything and rewrote from the beginning. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so in scoring, have you had any similar experience? <laughs> I have. Uh, I have, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, it's uh, film scoring is a, a delicate business, you know, uh, I, I have had uh, a couple times uh, where I've come up with uh, some ideas that I thought were going to be really appropriate and and going to really work, uh, but they uh, the the producers and the director uh, decided that they weren't so into it. But for the most part, I've been really uh, lucky that. Uh, I typically, uh, I have, uh, a close group of friends that I work with and, and, uh, we all know like when, when my, when my buddies hire me, they know what to expect from me. So, uh, I don't usually go through that kind of thing too much anymore. Yeah. Okay. But unfortunately, I mean, sometimes it happens. I mean, I can't. Oh, yeah, I, for sure. It definitely happens. Yeah. I mean, because you don't have complete control over it. I mean, like you have control over what you write, but as far as like what you turn in, like the filmmaker ultimately has the, the ultimate say in whether or not it's going to be used. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's a big part of it is that, uh, you know, you, you can't get too attached to anything that you turn in because you know that maybe the director is just going to be like, this is completely the wrong direction and you have to, you know, entirely start over from scratch, you know? Uh, so yeah, you, you have to, uh, definitely, 
have a thick skin to do this kind of work. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, I mean, like, this is like you're – you're putting all your time and your energy and your heart and soul into this stuff. And sometimes you get just a note back that's just like, this doesn't work. Can we try something again? And it's like, you know, it is fine. Like I, I've done, I've been doing it long enough that it, it never really bothers me, but like, I can see how for, for some younger, more cocky, uh, you know, a little, you know, I could see how it could be a difficult thing for some younger people. Uh, for me, I try to like be completely open to, uh, you know, other people's ideas and other people's input. And so like, you know, when I'm working with a director and they get back to me and they're like, well, this part works, but this part totally is totally doesn't work we need to try this or that or you know mm -hmm. i'm i'm like i'm always totally into that you know like i'm i i kind of love the collaborative process to be honest uh you know uh i really when i can get some feedback like honest you know hardcore feedback that i can use and that i understand uh i love incorporating that kind of stuff into my scores okay well let, let me ask you this about film scoring because uh you know i really don't have any knowledge about it whatsoever um so do you when you're approached with the idea of scoring a film does does the filmmaker come to you with the script or with actual like footage of the film usually it's uh the script comes first and uh you have to read through the script see if you're going to be interested and then they'll send you uh the film but to be honest uh you basically don't get the film until it's actually like until they have a locked cut okay so once once it's actually finished and maybe like all the vfx aren't totally done but at least like it's locked like the timing is all set so mm -hmm. I can go ahead and start like writing my music and because that's that's one thing you don't you don't want to you don't want to be working on a film before they have a locked cut because like you could be working on a scene and then it turns out that they're like well we we cut five seconds from this point and then we cut 20 seconds from this other point and then nothing that you did is ever going to match up again. So you're like, you're just toast, you know? Uh, right. So yes. it's like all that work for nothing. So yeah, basically, uh, mostly I don't get anything until it's really like ready to be worked on. Okay. And so what do you think is, is better for you? I mean, do you prefer to score or do you prefer to just like work with the band and, and put out an album? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, uh, to me, like, to be quite honest, like there's putting like working in a band and putting out an album and touring is very fun, but there's like, there's, something very special about working on a movie and uh and watching that movie in in a room full of people like i just uh the last movie that i worked on it's called suitable flesh uh the director is joe lynch we just we had our canadian premiere at uh at the Fantasia Film Festival in Montreal last weekend. And uh, the audience was just rabid. Like, they just ate it up. Like, literally, it was beautiful. And I will, I will, I will, I think I would say that, like, the, the experience of getting to see a film that you worked on in the presence of uh, a, a large enthusiastic audience uh is def definitely outweighs like playing a show because in a way it's kind of like you get to like it's almost like playing a show but you get to watch it 
you know, uh, mm-hmm. because you're in the audience and it's like all this work that you've already done. And now you just get to see the big payoff, you know? Uh, yeah. And you don't have to do anything. You just have to sit there and watch the film. And it's, <laughs> you know, it's, right. yeah, that that's one of my, one of my great, uh, and I try to do it every opportunity I get, but any, any film that I've scored, I always try to be there for the premiere uh, because it, it, there's just like, there's, yeah, there, there's in the, in the live music world, uh, there's, there's nothing that quite compares to like the feeling of like, you know, seeing a huge theater where the people really love what you've done, you know, uh, mm. and you get to actually be in the audience and witness it. That's that's the important part. And there's an anonymity to that, I suppose, because you're just one person in the audience. And the, the person, you know, in theory, sitting next to you doesn't even know who you are, probably. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. Yeah, totally. So you get some like honest feedback, like right then and there. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, people are it's yeah. You get to see like people are going to be cheering. They don't know who you are, so they're they're going to either cheer or they're not, or, you know, but like if they cheer in the spots where they're supposed to cheer for, then it's just, uh, you know, a, a, a totally beautiful experience for sure. Wow. That's pretty great. Pretty cool stuff, man. Um, so as far as uh, covering this album, um, yeah. uh, that, that's pretty much all I had. <laughs> okay. Pretty- there was not much else I could find that pertained to the songs, to like to the tracks on this album. Um, I guess yeah, I maybe a kind of weird one. I just thought this was like really. I mean, this was the first. This album, this co- weird comp CD, represents the first time that I was ever able to own any of this music. Uh, and and I think that's what the big thing for me was that it then I could listen to it whenever I wanted. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, and it was like understanding that, like, I don't know, I've, I've been into film music uh, literally since I was like six years old. Uh, But like, for some reason, when, when I was able to actually be able to listen to, what goblin was doing on some of these scores it just it was just what i needed like i mentioned i was either playing at the time it was 1995 i was either playing in hardcore bands or playing in jazz bands and it was like i just needed something else like Hmm. i was looking for anything else to guide me anything else to give me like a direction for like what I should want to do musically, you know, and this, and this album hit at just the right time. And, uh, you know, I bought it and I made tape, you know, tape copies for all my friends. And, you know, it was like, it was a thing. This was still the mid nineties, you know? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, uh, it's not like, you know, Led Zeppelin four or whatever, but it's like a pretty, you know, for me, it, it is my Led Zeppelin four, you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of the, the record that like made me think like, well, I kind of want to do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you are, I, I think that you're and I'm I mean, doing it now. So yeah. 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 For sure. And you know what? And to speak to the to this music, just to to for people that aren't familiar with it necessarily, I I will say that you know it's described as like kind of prog rock experimental synth driven uh, horror film music, but it's it's very they're very much like songs. Like when you listen oh, yeah, to these, because sure. like when you're watching the movie, you know you get the the portions, little clips of the music kind of interwoven into the into the visual, and then that's what kind of creates the the feel the the vibe. But when you're listening to the songs in their entirety alone, it's like they're very much just like instrumental prog prog music for the most part. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and yeah. not even like, uh, and what I really like about it is it's it is. Uh, I mean, it's genuine. 
It's genuine, authentic Italian prog, but focused through like a pop lens where, you know, there are choruses and there are verses and mm-hmm. it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like too much of for your, for your palate, you know, like yeah. there are, there are hooks and there are refrains and, uh, yeah, so I totally get that. That was that was a big thing for me too, uh, realizing that about them. Hmm. All right. So to so for for listeners, I would just say if you don't know Goblin, by all means, go listen to some of it wherever you can. Whether like, not obviously they're not going to find this record probably, but at least other compilations that they have out currently, there are some things that are out there, just not this one specifically. Um, but enough to kind of I actually I think there's a, I think there's a playlist on YouTube. Uh, mm. I, haven't, I haven't checked it really recently, but there used to be a playlist uh, on YouTube that was the exact track listing of this CD. Uh, oh, OK. Well, maybe I'll look for that and maybe I can link it uh, yeah. just to just to see, um, because it would be interesting to kind of hear it in its entirety. You know, sure. I've I've just listened to to pieces of it just uh, on my own, but um, yeah. So aside from this, I mean, like uh, this new EP that you have coming out with uh, yeah. Overcalc, um, what what is the plan currently uh, as far as this release and uh, and possible touring? Uh, well, we've been thinking about uh, touring. Uh, it's a little tricky. Um... Uh, I have uh, my my other band, Zombie, and uh, we've been working on uh, a lot of music uh, um, as well. So that that's been a little tricky lately. But I think the the plan is that maybe we'll do some shows together, and then we definitely want to do uh, more, you know, collaborative recording together for sure. Oh, so there might be some more uh, coming down the, the line for this. I think it's very possible. Yeah, that's cool. Great. Um, so no definite plans for touring, but it's a possibility. And then uh, Zombie as well. You're saying that you have a new album kind of in the works coming. That's also yeah, in the but pipeline that won't be until next year. That this is all sort of uh, distant future still. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what is in your most kind of uh, close future? Uh, I've been working on the new zombie record has been uh, basically my main uh, my main thing these days getting that ready okay yeah that's cool well um, I just like to say thank you for uh, taking some time to speak with me it's been a it's been a pleasure meeting you yeah likewise well best of luck with uh, with all of your current projects and all of your future projects and uh, you know I hope to uh, see you out there in the real world world sometime yeah man for sure Vinyl and Vision is a Psychic Static production. Theme song written and performed by Jeff Robbins of 123 Astronaut.